Human Services Finance Committee will come to order. Uh, we do have a quorum. Uh, Representative Pearson moves approval of the minutes for March 6, 2017. Any additions or corrections? Seeing none, all those in favor of approval of the minutes of March 6, 2017, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, aye. no. The minutes from March 6 are adopted. Uh, we have before us uh, House File 490. Uh, Representative Lean, welcome to the committee. I will go ahead and move House File 490 be laid over for possible inclusion in our Health and Human Services Omnibus Bill. Uh, Representative Lean, uh, to your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, House File 490 provides a rate for nonprofit nursing homes located in Moorhead equal to the median rate for nursing homes in North Dakota cities contiguous to Moorhead. So this would be Fargo. Uh, the bill will finish work that Representative Backer and I started in 2015, and I do appreciate his work on this effort, too, uh, when we were able to enact a similar provision for a nursing home in Breckenridge, Minnesota. Although seeing a more realistic state budget situation right now, North Dakota in recent years had raised its Medicaid rates paid to nursing homes. This led to a wide rate disparity in rates paid in border communities and has resulted in severe staffing issues for nursing homes located in the Minnesota communities. The nursing home reform bill two years ago does help the disparity, but it does, it does not completely solve the problem in Moorhead. There is a fiscal note on the bill that shows no cost in the first biennium but does show a cost of $4.189 million in the outlying biennium. I realize that we do follow a formal fiscal note process, but I want to share that I believe the cost for the bill may come down as it does not, as the current note does not take into consideration the impact of Minnesota's new rate reimbursement system in future years. In fairness, it also does not take into account the projected impact of future changes in North Dakota rates, which in recent years have trended downwards. I'm committed to working to address the fiscal no costs and moving the bill forward as the bill is important to maintaining the needed services for the elderly in the Moorhead area now and in the future. Members, Mr. Chair, I urge your support of uh, House File 490. And with me today is John Rewer from Eventide Lutheran Home in uh, Moorhead um, to answer any questions and to provide additional information on the bill. Thank you, Representative Lean. Questions for Representative Lean or the testifier? Representative Liebling. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I wonder, I, you know, this nursing home funding stuff is so complicated. I wonder if, um, I don't know if either Representative Lean or his testifier would really be able to explain, but what I'm interested in trying to understand is how this really works with the big reform that was done in the last biennium. Because, um, you know, I understood that that puts uh, long-term care on kind of a, a forecast basis. It's a cost-based or a value-based, I think we're calling it, um, reform. And so I would have thought that that would have taken care of this kind of problem. So, I, I, you know, I, I just wonder, and, um, you know, I'm not opposing the bill at all. I'm just wondering, uh, just because this is a, a big issue for the state, um, if there's anybody, I don't know if Mr. Held is still comes to these meetings. Or Actually, I think retired. Representative Schumacher Ooh. could probably address that better than anybody. Well, <laughs> okay, that'd be great if he could. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Liebling, um, the, the reason that they would be requesting a different uh, rate setting after we had put in place value-based reimbursement is because a lot of the rates are uh, based, are tied to a median rate, and so their rates are going to be adjusted to what the median statewide rate is. And so they have uh, a special, or in particular, uh, a different situation there because they're competing with South Dakota, or North Dakota, excuse me, um, the North Dakota homes there. And so the median rate actually uh, doesn't compete with them as well there. So they're not seeing the direct rates. So when it comes to wages and, and those types of things, they're not able to be reimbursed at the um, same level that they would like to be in order to be competitive with that. And that's why, um, because of the median rates that we have statewide here, that's the primary reason. So, thank Representative you. Leeling. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Chair Schumacher. I'm glad that you have a really good grasp of this. You may be true. You may be the only one here who does. I don't. I don't know if there. I hope there's somebody from DHS who does also. But um, so, 
um, does this mean then that uh, under if this bill were to become law that they would get that the increases along with the, the those increases that everybody gets and then there would be a how does it work percentage bump above that maybe representative lean knows the answer to that representative lean Thank you, Mr. Chair, members. Um, one thing to take a look at with this bill is that it would go into effect if it were passed in 2020. So in other words, this would give us time to see if the overall rate reimbursement that was enacted a couple years ago would be enough to cover the disparity. If not, this would be some additional funding. And again, um, it is directly related to the issue that North Dakota has those higher reimbursement rates. They're able to pay staff more. Um, so that, that, that's largely what, what's going on here. Okay, thank you, appreciate yep. the explanation. All right, thank you, other questions? <clears throat> All right, uh, hearing none, um, House File 490 is laid over for possible inclusion in the Health and Human Services Omnibus Bill. Thank you very much, Representative Lean. Thank you, Mr. Next Chair. Next up, members. we have House File 803, uh, Representative Baker. For Representative Baker, welcome uh, to the committee. I'll move House File 803 to be laid over for possible inclusion in the Health and Human Services Omnibus Bill. I see that there are no amendments. Uh, Representative Baker, we have the bill before us. Your bill. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair and members. Um, before you, I have a, uh, I think it's a great uh, workforce bill that helps us plug in the, uh, wor the dramatic workforce shortage we're having in our healthcare field. Um, there's some really good ideas out there and what this uh, bill does is provides a grant and a form of a competitive grant for neat ideas that are happening out there around Minnesota. Um, there are a couple of good ideas out there. Um, we've got Ms. Thomas here today to do some testifying and uh, we'll stand ready for questions afterwards. I also have experts behind us, uh, Mr. Chair, um, uh, on the bill. We're not planning on them testifying for time, but uh, I'll uh, let Ms. Thomas take it over. Thank you, Representative Baker. Welcome to the committee, Ms. Thomas. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. My name is Pat Thomas and I am a director in adult education down in Marshall, Minnesota. <clears throat> we are in times uh, where our healthcare field is struggling to find qualified workers. And the source that we're gonna find our future workers will come from our immigrant and refugee populations. A project I am working on that could be supported with the passage of this bill is that one that will help lower literacy individuals gain the skills to move into the healthcare field. Our adult education program is working on creating a reading program that will raise one's literacy level at the same time, it only uses vocabulary consistent with the healthcare field and concepts that are consistent with the healthcare field. This method is research based. In other words, we're going to kill two birds with one stone. One literacy curriculum to help people move forward into the healthcare field. This will be an online program that any individual could use free off of our website. It would be most effective if used in combination with an adult education program, but it could certainly be used separately by any individual who wants to use it. It will address the reading levels of grades 3.5 to 8.5. The reason we have gone up to 8.5 is at grade level eight, we feel people by our experience are able to pass the certified nursing assistant class from experience. It is important that we're not teaching vocabulary only in the CNA class, but the ability to raise one's literacy level so the individual can aspire beyond the CNA role. This bill is all about not wasting human capital in our state. And I would encourage this committee to move this bill forward. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Other questions for the testifier or for the bill author? <coughs> Representative Hamilton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, uh, I want to thank you, uh, Representative Baker, for bringing this forward. And I'd just like to say, I. I know Ms. Thomas, I uh, actually worked with her. We started a program in my private sector job um, working with uh, refugees and we titled it the New Immigrant Program. 
And uh, with her with her help, it has been a very, very successful program. And so again, I just wanna say kudos to all the work that you do. Thank you for all the work that you do, uh, reaching out to employers and others. And uh, yeah, my support, thank you. Thank you, Representative Hamilton and uh, other questions. All right. Seeing no other questions, uh, thank you, Ms. Thomas, for your testimony, and thank you, Representative Baker. With that, House File 803 is laid over for possible inclusion in our Health and Human Services Omnibus Bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. All right, next up we have House File 804, Representative Keel. Is she here? Nope, Poppy. Uh, 941, House Representative Poppy. <laughs> All right. Welcome to the committee, Representative Poppy. Uh, I will move House File 941 be laid over for possible inclusion in the Health and Human Services Omnibus Bill. We have the bill before us. I understand that there is an A17127 author's amendment. Yes. I'm going to go ahead and move the A17127 amendment. A twit in the shape that you'd like. All those in favor of adoption of the uh, amendment, please say aye. Aye. Those aye. opposed, no. The A17 is adopted. Uh, Representative Poppy, aye. to your bill, House File 941, as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. House File 941 is a bill that talks about caregivers, and especially caregivers um, who are dealing with people who have dementia or um, Alzheimer's. So it's um, kind of a um, special population of people who are going through some um, mental deficiency challenges, and um, the spouse and or caregiver is um, involved in that and this would help that person to get some respite care and also to help um, the families just feel um, as though they're getting the support that they need. So either through education or through um, other support. And I can describe it further. It's, it's really a fairly simple bill. It's just a small amount of money that would go toward the area agencies on aging, and they would be able to distribute that to the seven area agencies um, in order to be able to provide some support services um, to be able to have um, the caregivers get some respite and to have the people be able to stay in their homes longer. All right. Uh, thank you, Representative Poppy. Other questions for Representative Poppy? Seeing no uh, questions, is there anyone from the audience who would like to testify on this bill? Seeing none, final word, Representative Poppy. Thank you, Mr. Chair, I appreciate your support. Thank you uh, for coming to Health and Human Services Finance. With that, House File uh, 941, as amended, is laid over for possible inclusion. Uh, we also have House File 942. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, I will go ahead and move House File 942 be laid over for possible inclusion. And I understand that there is an A17-128 author's amendment. I will move the A17 for adoption. All those in favor of adoption of A17, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. A17 is adopted. Um, representative uh, to your bill as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. And this is another one that is dealing maybe most, especially with people um, who have um, taken care of somebody who has Alzheimer's or related dementia. And um, the essential community support um, area would be increased. There would be a small um, amount that would allow for an increase in uh, support services and it would allow for companion services and respite care to be included in um, the kinds of services provided. So there's a, a bit of a, a cost to it, but in the long run, um, the cost would be minimized because if people can keep their um, spouse or um, needed um, services person in the home for a longer period of time, you'd actually be saving money because they're not gonna be in nursing homes. So and those are more expensive. So it's kind of a, uh, hopefully it would be an opportunity to keep people in their homes for a longer period of time, be able to provide some, again, some support uh, and respite care and be able to save some money. 
Thank you, Representative Poppy, and members will note the fiscal note that is included within the packet, uh, 332 and 18, 470 and 19. Is that correct, Representative Poppy? <coughs> yeah. All right. Other questions? Our Representative Loeffler. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, Representative Hoppy, I just was quick trying to go through the, uh, the amendment we adopted, and on page two, line four, we put the word family in front of caregiver, and I know a lot of caregivers who are not family. Um, they're neighbors, they're close friends. Um, not everybody's lucky enough to have family who live close by um, or who are able to, to step up and take on those responsibilities, and I'm wondering um, if you or if any of your resources might be able to indicate whether this is narrowing um, the caregivers that could be incorporated in, 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 in the support of this. I really admire and appreciate the work that you're doing. I just want to make sure that we're not cutting out people who have to be dependent upon others. In fact, I think the total is 20% of all adults do not have any children, and many people have children that don't live nearby. Unfortunately, they're in another state, um, or they're in a situation in which they're not able to, to provide that day-to-day -day support. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I believe I'm going to call a friend to be able to come down and hopefully provide some information. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon. I'm Rachel Shands with the Department of Human Services, <coughs> Aging and Adult Services Division, and my area manages the Essential Community Supports Program. Um, so this amendment is really technical. It was just aligning the name and statute with our uh, the technical name of our service. Um, however, even though it's called a family caregiver support service, that doesn't mean it can only be provided to family caregivers. It can also be provided to other informal caregivers, whether they be um, neighbors or partners or other uh, caregivers that are, are caring for older adults. Representative Loeffler. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. We always struggle in health and human services how to describe our program so that the public and people who um, are interested in their services can understand that. And I hope if this, as this moves along, we'll think about a broader description, maybe family and other caregiving support or something else so it's, it's clear to uh, people that this goes beyond family because a lot of people are dependent on a, a broader network. Thanks. Thank you. Other questions? Seeing no other questions, is there anybody uh, in the audience that would like to testify on House File 942? Uh, seeing none further, and last thoughts, Representative Poppy? Mr. Chair, thank you very much for the opportunity to be in front of you today. I, I just uh, have a, a heartfelt uh, um, need to bring these bills forward because I think they're important and I think that they can provide um, help to, to caregivers and to those that are in need of the care. So I very much appreciate the opportunity. So thank you. Thank you, Representative Poppy, and we do appreciate the brevity of your uh, your. Uh, testimony and uh, in respect for committee time we do appreciate that as well house file 942 as amended is laid over thank you representative thank you. poppy we have uh, representative keel is back representative keel uh, brings house file 804 representative keel welcome back to the committee i will move house file 804 be laid over for possible inclusion in the health and human services omnibus bill I see no amendments in the packet. Representative Keel, the bill is before us. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, uh, House File 804 um, is a, a workforce bill that is trying to help with uh, scholarships for nurses, uh, especially in the uh, home care, uh, home and community services <coughs> along with nursing homes. And um, there is a portion that we removed earlier uh, that would have helped um, more uh, for more staff that maybe isn't quite as qualified, but we we did remove that if you heard it in HHS policy. So, and with that, I am going to uh, have my testifiers um, address the committee. Welcome to the committee. Please uh, state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. 
Mr. Chair, committee members, my name is Erin Bowie. I'm the Director of Government Affairs for Care Providers of Minnesota. Here today on behalf of the Long-Term Care Imperative, I want to thank Representative Keel for bringing this bill forward. We've heard a lot of sobering statistics about the aging population of Minnesota. We have 60,000 seniors turning 65 every year now through the year 2030. We are in a few short years for the first time going to have more seniors than school-aged children in Minnesota. We also, as you have heard, have a workforce crisis in the senior care uh, services sector. Across all uh, settings and providers of senior care services, we hear this. One of their biggest issues is that they have uh, simply no applicants for available jobs. This bill, we think, is another piece of the puzzle in fixing this problem. We had another piece of the puzzle, hopefully, with Representative Baker's previous bill. Uh, this bill, I will run through the first section, which is the loan forgiveness portion. Um, the bill adds home care nurses and nurses in uh, housing with services settings to the nurse loan forgiveness program. Uh, one thing I do want to note is that our intention was to have this be an additional appropriation to the fund, not to take from the existing fund. So it would not, uh, as noted in the fiscal note, uh, uh, take from the funds that are being utilized by uh, other groups under this program. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of, of the committee. My name is Carrie Thurlow uh, with Leading Age Minnesota and also here on behalf of the Long-Term Care Imperative. Uh, I'm going to cover the last two sections of the bill, sections two and three. In addition to the loan forgiveness program that Ms. Bowie referred to in section one, um, there are two other strategies that are part of this bill. Section two relates to the nursing facility scholarship program that has proven to be a very successful tool in nursing homes to help attract and retain uh, workers within nursing homes. Um, one of the items that we did in 2015 was to expand the application of nursing facility scholarships to also allow to help um, pay student debt um, obligations uh, for people who go um, take positions in nursing homes. Um, at that time, we placed a condition that they have to be newly hired and recently graduated. And what we found and heard from our members is that actually creates an equity issue um, because um, if you can only forgive the debt for those employees that are recently graduated, there are, um, which is defined as in the last 12 months, there are other um, folks that may come to work in nursing homes that have been graduated for a much longer period of time. And so they, as, a, as purely an equity issue to treat uh, more of their employees the same, um, we're asking to remove the requirement that they be recently graduated to qualify for that student um, um, loan forgiveness portion of the nursing facility scholarships. Section three has to do with the Home and Community Based Services Scholarship Program, which was also a newly created scholarship program um, in, uh, that was passed in 2015. Um, so we've gone through two rounds. Um, this is an RFP process um, run through the Minnesota Department of Health. And we've gone through two rounds so far. And what the Minnesota Department of Health and what providers have reported is that it is an extremely competitive process where the number of applications actually far exceed these, the appropriation that currently exists to that program. Um, and so um, we're seeking additional funding to that program to help me better meet the demand. Um, I think that there are some assumptions in the fiscal note um, I, uh, that may not entirely reflect our intent. I think that it, I think the fiscal note reflects a doubling of the appropriation and I think that while it's a blank appropriation that can be um, scaled, I think we were looking at more around the $500,000 increase to the appropriation. So I just want to make that clarification for the record as well. Um, taken in total, all three of these approaches, the Nurse Loan Forgiveness Program, the Nursing Facility Scholarship Program, and Home and Community-Based Scholarship Programs, present opportunities to attract a workforce to um, senior care settings and help create uh, career tracks um, and helping uh, finance educational opportunities to improve training opportunities for these folks as well, and has been proven to be a successful strategy. So thanks for the consideration of this. We're happy to answer any questions. Representative Kuehl, I see in the packet that there is an A1 amendment. We'll just uh, that. I don't believe we want to offer that. All right. All right. Uh, anyone in the audience that wishes to? Representative Liebling. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. And that kind of goes to my question because uh, I saw that as well. And there's a whole other part to this bill, and that is a repealer. Um, and I, uh, the re language being repealed is this language about administration of medications by unlicensed personnel. So I hope somebody's going to speak to that because that seems like kind of more major than the rest of the bill. Mr. Chair. Representative Kuehl. Um, uh, that should have been uh, removed. Representative Liebling, I understand that it did not make deadline. Well, Mr. Chair. Um, it, it was, let me take that back and say it did make deadline, but there was no confirmation that we didn't post it. Well, well Mr. Chair, I, I think that. But it inadvertently made it into the pack. <laughs> Okay, I, so I, am I understanding then that so that was the intent of the author to, to repeal the repealer <laughs> and and because of for procedural reasons that didn't happen? Is that what I'm understanding? Ms. Bowie. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Liebling, uh, the intention had uh, originally been to add the A1 amendment, in which case uh, Section 4 and 5 uh, would have been applicable, but uh, because we did not do the A1 amendment, uh, we should delete Section 4 and 5 from the bill. Well, Mr. Chair, I guess. Um, Representative Liebling. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <coughs> You know, I don't know to the degree to which the chair would entertain that motion, but I certainly don't feel comfortable moving the bill. You know, I, I guess this bill is probably going to be laid over. Is that right? But even so, I uh, think we shouldn't pass, or we're not going to vote on it, pass it anyway. I guess, but I don't know why we wouldn't just delete those sections if if that would be if that's the author's. Uh, mm -hmm desire to do representative Kuehl. uh mr chair and members uh if you would if the chair would entertain an oral amendment i would request that we remove uh section four and five from the uh bill <laughs> ms Pinelli, could we confirm that that would be <coughs> appropriate action to take um, correct motion Mr. Chair, members, yes, I believe um, sections four and five do relate to um, the language in the A1 amendment. And so if if we're not going to be adding the A1 amendment, I think at this time it would make sense to remove sections four and five from the bill. So Representative Keel, uh, I would make a motion that uh, to strike everything below line 3.24. Ms. Finelli, would that be a correct motion to remove section four and five? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, uh, the motion could be just on page three, delete sections four and five. Representative Constantine. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, not to be a stickler, but should we um, vote to suspend the rules first. Um, since, I mean, I don't know. I'm asking the question. I just don't want to get hung up later on. I don't think that that would be necessary, Representative Constantine. And the motion stands that okay. uh, I'm making uh, to remove sections four and sections sure. five on page three right. Change the of the 80, uh, House File 804 as it sits <laughs> before us. Representative Constantine. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. I forgot about Rule 14, um, where you get to change them. <laughs> All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? And the motion prevails. And Sections 4 and Sections 5 have been stricken from the bill as it sits before us. To your bill as amended, Representative Keel. Haley. Representative Haley. Um, I'm fine with it. Representative Keel. Um, I would believe that the bill would stand as we were uh, described it earlier. So I don't know if there are any other questions or testifiers. Representative Liebling. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you. I'm glad we got that out of the way. And, and now I, I wanted to ask a question to the bill that was described. And that just, Representative Keel, I don't know if you can answer this or if somebody else can, but 
we see a lot of bills for scholarship relief or for um, you know loan relief, which I think is a great tool that we use to um, encourage people to enter certain fields. And we all know that students are carrying far too much debt anyway. And so I think loan relief is a, is really a great thing. But I I just want to know: is there a place that we kind of pull together all of the loan relief programs that we have because every time I see one like this, I just wonder, aren't we already doing this? Or, you know, is this being done in some other areas? And I just wonder if they're sort of, and I know everybody wants to use this as a tool to sort of grab some of that shrinking pool of workers. So there's some competition around this, but I just think it would be really helpful to sort of know where in the state for what are we using loan loan forgiveness programs and kind of line them up and compare them I, is there is that available to your knowledge or maybe that's something we ought to ask for from the ola i don't know yep. representative peel um uh, there may be more than i'm thinking about at this point but i believe that the bill is more directed and maybe miss pinelli can explain even more but i I believe it is for high need area. It isn't just for the whole state if you want to apply for a scholarship. Um, but there are places where they are having trouble employing anybody to work um, in these facilities. And maybe I should let, uh, I don't know. Representative Keel, I think we're going to have someone come down from the uh, agency, the department, and uh, speak yeah. to that. Mr. Wilson, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Will Wilson from the Department of Health, Office of Rural Health and Primary Care. We administer the state's loan forgiveness program. Um, and actually, they are the, the eligible professional types are listed in the statute that's here. Um, and so that's these are all of the, the professions in our, our current program. There are other programs as well. There's a federal one that's called the National Health Service Corps. And there's another state federal hybrid one that's called the State Loan Repayment Program. Uh, we work with all three of them to make sure that we're coordinating um, to make sure that the funds are spent appropriately. Representative Lieberman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for that. So if our, if our constituents ask us, where can I find out about what loan forgiveness might be available in, in, in the healthcare area? Where do we direct them? Mr. Um, Wilson. Our website would be a good place to start. Um, we can share that with the committee um, and make sure that everybody has that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone from the audience that wishes to testify on House File 804? Seeing none, any uh, members' questions? Representative Keel, you have the last word. Well, I thank you very much, Mr. Chair and members. Um, I hope you'll support this bill. I think it will really help us to uh, uh, encourage workforce and give opportunity to maybe some people that would like to get into the medical field that don't have other means to uh, get the education or help that they need. So thank you very much. With that, uh, House File 804 is laid over for possible inclusion in the Health and Human Services Omnibus Bill. <coughs> Representative Schumacher. You have several bills before the <laughs> committee today. Which one would you prefer to start with? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to uh, call up first House File 1500. <coughs> Sorry, that one. And uh, have that be re referred to the General Register. We have a testifier from out of town who you met earlier, and I want to make sure that she can get on the road while it's still daylight out. <laughs> That's, that sounded a lot. That tone was a little off. I apologize for that. That wasn't. Representative uh, Schumacher moves House File 1400 be re referred to the General Register. We have the bill before us. Yes, and the reason, members, that I went to the General Register is that the fiscal note came back with uh, zero impact. Uh, this is just uh, uh, kind of a cleanup from a bill that we had introduced two years ago, then again last year, to uh, address adult basic education and the work that they do with CNA training and the reimbursements that uh, nursing facilities are required to pay for that training. Uh, we passed it last year to allow for adult basic education to be part of that process. And 
and this bill cleans it up a little bit further and cuts out the uh, uh, CNA from the process. So the way that it is now is that adult basic education provides the uh, classes to become certified as a CNA and then the facilities have to pay the uh, new CNA who's then supposed to reimburse the adult basic education. This would streamline it so the reimbursement would go directly to the adult basic education program. And I see you have a testifier with you. I do. Would you like to introduce? Her? I would like to uh, welcome Pat Thomas to uh, present her testimony. Welcome, Ms. Thomas. Please uh, state your name for the record, and uh, we will look forward to your testimony. Pat Thomas, and again, I'm a adult education manager down in Marshall, Minnesota. <clears throat> In our area, we are doing a lot of CNA training, and that oftentimes is done through grants and oftentimes is done through our program funds. Um, what this bill would allow us to do is provide a revolving door that as we have an individual, we train them, they are successfully employed for 90 days at a long-term nursing facility, then we would be reimbursed for the tuition, book fee, test out fee, and up to 30% more for the adult education services that we offer. So when they got their job successful, then we get that money back so then we can train more people. And what my hope is, with this bill, we can create this revolving door where we have the capacity to provide more CNA training. I would share with you that of the people, and I am guessing we served in Marshall, I would believe close to 100 people this year. Maybe that's a little high. Maybe 60 people that we have served through our CNA classes, 95% of them could not have paid for the tuition. And what we see is we are wasting human capital out there. If we help them through the tuition and get them their CNA, what I'm watching is people going on becoming LPNs, just like what was testified to earlier with your scholarship programs. A lot of our people are going on to become LPNs, RNs, and we have some nurse practitioners that have come out of our program. But none of that would have happened if somebody hadn't helped them with the tuition to become a CNA. So again, this bill is all about not wasting human capital, which is our greatest resource in our state, and I would encourage this committee to move it forward. Thank you. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to testify to House File 1400? Seeing none, we'll go to member questions for the author or the testifier. Seeing neither, Representative Schumacher. Please support my bill. Representative Schumacher renews his motion that House File 1400 be re referred to the General Register. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion prevails, and House File 1400 is re-referred. Thank, Thank you, members. And she's on the road before nightfall. Yes. <laughs> Representative Schumacher. Uh, yes, next I would like to take up House File 823, the elderly waiver reform, and move that that be laid over for possible inclusion. Representative Schumacher moves House File 823 be laid over for possible inclusion in the Health and Human Services Omnibus Bill. We have the bill before us. I understand that, that the A2 amendment is an author's amendment. Representative Schumacher. Yes, Mr. Chair, and I would like to move the A2 amendment. Representative Schumacher moves the A2 amendment. Any discussion to the amendment? And before we go to that, Representative Schumacher, maybe you could explain just briefly what that entails. Right, so this amendment is uh, just making some changes along, uh, trying to work with uh, the different groups involved to clarify a few things. There's um, just trying to clean up some language and uh, clean up some of the definitions there. So this will get into the form. I'd like to continue it. Questions to the A2 amendment. Seeing none, all those in favor of adopting the A2 amendment, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Yeah. A2 is adopted. 
to your bill as amended representative schumacher thank you mr chair members i'll be brief with this so we can get into the technical portions of it but the uh, elderly waiver reform portions that we're working on today basically just trying to make sure that we have um, appropriate reimbursement and keep up with uh, the changing dynamics of this area as we've talked a lot about in this committee and uh, throughout the last few years the aging population has uh, their challenges as we move forward and we want to make sure that our systems are keeping up with that we uh, dealt with that with the value-based reimbursement system with our nursing facilities last year this is kind of the next step uh, away from that in order to uh, try and get that brought up to where we'd like it to be too. And so uh, what this bill does is it adds more quality components to the elderly waiver system and those who are providing elderly waiver services, as well as making sure that there is more input from the, the receiver of elderly waiver services. And so uh, we wanna make sure that there's quality components attached to it, as well as making sure that um, the rates are kept, that the rates keep up with um, our days and so with that I have a couple testifiers here and I cannot tell them apart every time I have them come up So mr. Burke from is sitting to your left and to your far left is mr. Boston <laughs> And they are here to uh, Help with technical details. Thank you. Welcome to the committee and uh, whomever would like to go first uh, State your name for the record and uh, proceed with your testimony. Yep. Uh, thank you. Uh, mr. Chair uh, Representative uh, Schumacher members of the committee. Uh, my name is Todd Bergstrom. I work with care providers in Minnesota I'm here with my colleague Jeff Bostic from Leading Age Minnesota and we're on behalf here uh, of the long-term care imperative. Uh, so well over a year ago we began working with our members to reform the elderly waiver program. Um, as a reminder the program began over 25 years ago and is used by over 30,000 Minnesotans annually to cover the cost of care that helps them stay in the community and reduce state spending on more expensive long-term care settings. Uh, it is really important to note that to be on the elderly waiver program, a person must meet the same level of care required uh, to reside in a nursing facility. So these are folks whose care and financial eligibility meet the same terms as entering a nursing facility. Uh, with the goal of preparing elderly waiver to serve a growing number of seniors in the future, our proposal reforms the payment, policies, and approved processes uh, while importantly investing in quality. Uh, there are three areas to the bill, and I'm going to speak first to um, our proposal as it relates to the uh, reforming of the elderly waiver rates. Um, and to that extent, I will be speaking to the changes um, that were just amended. Um, so uh, the first area is elderly waiver payment. Um, elderly waiver provides services in settings such as assisted living or housing with services, as well as importantly in the community. The proposal creates annually new service rates every January based on the personnel employed by using wage information from the Minnesota Department of Employment and Economic Development. In addition to wage information, these service rates also have the following factors applied. Taxes and benefits, program support, administration, as well as RN or social worker oversight. Um, for example, or to give you some examples of the rates that we're proposing to change, um, so for services provided uh, by elderly waiver, and I'll also mention uh, CADI residential services, the new component rates are created for the following. Home management and support services, home care aid, home health aid, and medication setups by a licensed nurse. Importantly, we also in our efforts with our members also worked uh, uh, by having discussions with the Leadership Council on Aging, as well as with the Department of Human Services to have um, discussions around what are the rates that in the community are not presently working or allowing for services to be brought into people's homes. And so uh, these rates we are also in our proposal uh, changing. Uh, these include chore services, companion services, home delivered meals, as well as the services that provide homemaker, uh, as well as adult day services. Uh, finally, um, the one additional payment reform that we have in our proposal is uh, we propose for services in an assisted living, uh, the addition of what we are calling a cognitive and behavioral needs factor uh, for those persons who exhibit cognitive and behavioral needs but don't um, have, a, a, say, a, a larger need for additional hours of service. So with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff Bostic to talk about the other two areas of reform. Welcome, Mr. Bostic. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Um, I want to talk about just a couple other uh, pieces that are in the bill. Uh, you know, what Todd summarized is the new rate uh, methodology, uh, which we think is obviously very much needed, uh, something that hasn't been done in, uh, in years for the, uh, for the entire program for elderly waiver. Um, the additional uh, pieces we're also uh, looking at are <coughs> some performance measures, which don't exist today. We would uh, um, intend to create these for the uh, residential providers, which are the bulk of the, uh, the the program, and be able to use them as a comparative tool through a, uh, through a report card, uh, and potentially uh, ultimately be able to use them as payment incentives. Uh, although that would be uh, that's not called for directly in the bill because we think there would need to be time to develop the measures and put the measures out there and get people used to uh, measuring cells against them. Uh, and there's some work to uh, needed to be done to get these in place. Uh, some of them use uh, relatively easy to access data or existing data, uh, like collecting some data on workforce, but we also include a proposal to do formal uh, customer satisfaction surveys of uh, people receiving uh, services in these settings, which uh, would obviously take some work and, uh, and resources and be an undertaking to get in place and start uh, uh, creating scores based on that. Um, the final piece of the bill are some uh, some issues that our members have raised around the uh, the process for uh, uh, for how elderly waiver is uh, implemented in terms of getting people onto the program and and uh, establishing what the uh, the payment rate is going to be. Uh, so I'm going to highlight just a, a couple of changes there. Uh, one would be improving the uh, the amount of information that's shared between the, uh, the the provider and the case manager in particular in terms of what the uh, uh, provider gets in terms of what the case manager has seen uh, about the client uh, and improving the uh uh, the ability to share back and forth and make sure that the service plan that the um, that is in place for the client is appropriate to what they really need. Um, so an additional piece along the same lines is uh, some standardized rules around when a reassessment, a reassessment or a significant change uh, should be done for a client. Uh, under current law, it's not. Uh, there's nothing that addresses when that should be done, other than it definitely has to be done um, every year. You need to uh, renew the uh, eligibility for services. Um, but with the population on the program today being more more frail, more complex than it used to be, uh, many people will develop some additional needs at some point within that uh, year's period of time, and we want some clarity around the fact that case managers should do a uh, uh, a reassessment in those cases. Um, and finally, there's there's issues with coordinating the financial eligibility piece for uh, the Medicaid program with the service eligibility piece. Uh, the financial eligibility often taking uh, longer to be finalized. Uh, and under current law, the, the service assessment, once it's done, is only good for uh, 60 days. Um, and then it expires, and then if you actually have someone on site and been providing services to them, you uh, not get paid for that time period, so we uh, have a proposal to use a phone uh, renewal of the original assessment to uh, lengthen the, uh, uh, the period of time in cases where the financial eligibility doesn't get completed in 60 days. Um, and with that, I think we're open to any, uh, any questions committee members may have. Anyone from the audience wishing to testify or give remarks on House File 823? Seeing none, member questions for the author or the testifiers. Seeing neither, Representative Schumacher to your bill as amended. Thank you for your support. That said, House File 823 as amended is laid over for possible inclusion in the Health and Human Services Omnibus Bill. Representative Schumacher, you have on, only one left. Uh, two left, actually, Mr. Two? Chair. Yes. Uh, next, I'd like to move House File 500 to be laid over for possible inclusion. Representative <coughs> Schumacher moves House File 500 be laid over for possible inclusion in the Health and Human Services Omnibus Bill. We have the bill before us. To your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, House File 500 is uh, more cleanup language from the value-based reimbursement system as we move forward. Um, the first year of implementation always has 
a few things that uh, we didn't realize would take place, and then they did take place, and so we're just trying to clean up a few of the things that were there. A lot of it deals with definitions and uh, what it is what category of service uh, things are considered to be part of. Um, and so that's really what we're looking to do here. I will again just go uh, straight into testimony from Mr. Bergstrom and Mr. Bostic with uh, the technical work that we have here. Mr. Bergstrom, welcome again to the committee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Schumacher and members of the committee. Uh, yes, so uh, as, as noted by Representative Schumacher, this is intended to um, address some of the ambig amb ambiguities um, that uh, have come about since we passed the bill in 2015, as well as strengthen certain areas. Uh, so just to quickly walk through the general areas. So uh, one area we'd like to clarify, and again, this is um, not, a, this is actually, this is current practice, is to clarify in statute that nurse consultant costs are part of direct care and allow uh, central office nurse consultants uh, to be distributed uh, or allocated amongst their uh, facility locations. Uh, we clarify the definition of the health insurance pass-through. Presently, we have a reference in statute to the ACA regarding the definition of full-time employees. Uh, we actually have just taken the full-time employee definition um, and placed it into the bill. Um, likewise, we clarify that part-time employee dependents and retirees are part of fringe benefits and not included in the pass-through. Um, we also include uh, additional detail on what fringe benefits are allowable costs. Um, this is again addressing what is current practice, but codifying that things such as, I believe, uh, dental insurance or short or long term disability are things that are, in fact, um, fringe employee benefits. Uh, additional areas uh, so uh, you'll see that we sunset the minimum wage increases that were passed in 2014. Um, um, the reason for that is they presently kind of exist outside of the rate structure. Uh, the assumption is they are being built into the rate system as we progress each year. And so to leave them outside and continue to be paid for, you would essentially be driving up costs to the state over time. So those are taken out. Uh, we also um, have uh, language that reduces the likelihood of penalties occurring for failed or late submission of MDS data um, um, that is used to determine individual rates. Uh, we're also proposing, and I believe this is in a couple other bills, to try and coordinate uh, changes of rates. Uh, presently, there are a number of ways that a provider via bed layaway, or bed closure, or single bed incentives, or construction projects can, in fact, ask for a change in rate. Um, we are proposing that for all but the construction projects, that these be either re that these be effective on July 1 and January 1. Um, and we believe this will, A, make it a lot easier for private pay, um, we believe there's also probably a slight fiscal savings, but uh, probably more importantly, allow um, for better administration of the program. Uh, and then finally, we also, um, are, are, are in our bill, are asking that we allow providers to change their single bed election annually. Uh, presently, uh, this may be done via bed layaway, bed closure, or construction project. Um, we'd like to return to where we used to have it, um, maybe 20 years <coughs> And that would be an annual election on the cost report. Mr. Bostic. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Members of the committee, I'll uh, go quickly over a few other uh, pieces. There's a, uh, an APS uh, adjustment to rates uh, that was hypothetically uh, you know, intended under the old system to, uh, to be the adjustment to rates every year. That, that language is still there and has traditionally recently been used just to adjust property rates. Uh, and we would propose to start doing that again as of uh, uh, January 1 of 2018. Uh, we, we have a proposal to allow the use of electronic signatures, uh, which is something that came up in the recodification process last year. We identified that there are some references to signatures that it's not clear that you don't need actually to have something signed on paper. And we uh, want to be sure we're following all the uh, modern practices where appropriate. Um, Redefining allowable bad debt. Uh, this is an area where the, uh, in working with the department, uh, we've uh, felt like uh, bad debt in cases where people are trying to collect uh, mostly from uh, private pay residents, often in cases where they're applying for Medicaid and maybe not able to get on Medicaid uh, due to a transfer or something like that and tracking down that money, something that you're required to do. Uh, but is also very difficult. Uh, this would allow, after you've made reasonable efforts, that it be uh, recognized as an allowable cost and used in the uh, uh, in the calculation of the of rates. Um, 
the scholarship program that we talked about earlier in a previous bill, the language about uh, striking newly hired and recently graduated uh, is also being carried in this bill because the nursing facility scholarship program is technically part of the payment rates for nursing homes. So it makes sense to have that language uh, included here. Uh, some language, the, a couple things that we pulled um, from working with the department that are actually being carried in their uh, bill would be to uh, uh, require a report from DHS on a biannual basis on the impact of VBR, um, which we think is very important to uh, you know, have a sense of what this uh, major uh, reform is actually doing, actually producing for, uh, for caregivers and uh, the people served out there. Um, and then there was a, a critical access nursing facility program that was suspended at the time of the rate reform in 2015 because the rate reform uh, was essentially a better deal for those facilities identified as critical access than what they were getting under that program. Um, uh, and two years later in looking at it uh, both on our side and the department, we have some thoughts about where we might use a uh, critical access program in the future, but nothing that's really uh, ready to be implemented at this point in time. So we would propose to suspend that again for an additional uh, two years. Um, and I think that's uh, uh, really all we have to say about the bill. I guess I would just you know, emphasize, as we said, it's, a, it's basically an effort to clean up a major uh, piece of legislation from two years ago now that we've had a little bit of experience with it and uh, have seen how, uh, how it's working in uh, practice. Is there anyone in the audience that wishes to testify to House File 500? Anyone in the audience? Seeing none, member questions. Representative Liebling. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And there is a lot here. And um, I, first of all, I was looking and I didn't see a fiscal note. Is there a fiscal note for this? Mr. Berg. Ms. Mr. Chair, Representative Liebling, it's pending. It didn't get done from this committee hearing. Okay, well, Mr. Chair, given that, given that the fiscal note isn't here, I, I certainly think that this really requires consideration and looking at what the cost is going to be. Um, now, I recognize that we're just going to lay it over, but I have to say, I mean, none of, the, none of the advocates have come to talk to me about this. So I'm, I, you know, I really haven't had the opportunity to dig into this, but I've kind of heard some things going by here kind of quickly that give me a little concern. And I, um, I, I wonder if somebody from DHS is here. I don't know who, rep who uh, replaced Mr. Held, but I sure hope there's somebody at DHS that's looking out for the taxpayer and helping the legislature understand here because obviously the advocates are on one side of this thing, but um, we're talking probably about a lot of money here, I'm, I'm guessing. I think I see Ms. Clark coming down. The and to be fair, Mr. Chair, uh, no one can replace the great Bob Held. Yeah. <laughs> but, I'm afraid that but. might be true. <laughs> Ms. Cook, welcome to the committee. You can state your name for the record, identify who you represent, and then uh, make comment to the question. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Valerie Cook. I'm the Division Director for Nursing Facility Rates and Policy at DHS. <laughs> Representative Liebley, maybe you could re rephrase or restate yeah. the question. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, so, Ms. Cook, I wonder if you and your agency, your division, have uh, been working on this legislation. Do you have uh, any comments on it for us? Um, you know, this is. Let me just say, this is an area I think that <coughs> probably, with the exception of Representative Schumacher, most of us don't have feel that we completely understand. And um, so we really, at least, I should perhaps uh, just speak for myself. I really used to rely on Mr. Held a lot to kind of explain, uh, you know, what's going on in this area and make sure that we're actually acting in the interests of the people we're serving and of the taxpayers of the state, because this is an area where we spend a lot of money. And so um, I just wonder if you've had a chance to look at this legislation and if you have comments on it. Ms. Cook. Mr. Chair, Representative, um, the as you said, there is a lot of stuff here, and so it's a complex fiscal note which is under review. Um, so we have looked at this very carefully. Majority of the components in this bill do align with the governor's um, proposal, so that we, you know, we're, we're both proposing similar cleanup things. There are some variances um, that will have potentially have some fiscal impact. 
Follow up, Representative Liebling. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And one thing in particular that kind of caught my eye as it went by here is the, um, the section about bad debt. So in the bill, um, the, you know, so the, as I understand the way we're doing this reimbursement now, um, costs for the uh, facilities get kind of um, reported in and then that is used in a formula to determine what the rates will be. And so as things increase, that increases the rates statewide. So here it looks to me like um, they're now in this bill taking bad debt even from private pay patients. And where so where there's bad debt, they are taking that bad debt and baking it into the rate process to essentially have it be paid by the state at some level. <laughs> Am I misunderstanding that or is that something that's already happening? Ms. Cook. Mr. Chair, Representative, um, yes, it would be adding to the costs of a nursing facility service. Bad debt is a, would be considered an administrative cost. And so the, the under VBR, there's kind of two major components what, that are cost-based and, uh, and a price-based. And so this component would fall under the price-based, but, the, so, but uh, increases in bad debt that resulted in the, in the seven county metro facilities that establishes that, that price would have a, a rate impact and would have a fiscal impact that's, that's um, under review right now. Okay, well. Representative Well, Lincoln. thank you, Mr. Chair. So I guess I just would say, I don't know what the chair intends to do with this right now, um, but I certainly think that members should, you know, this is one of those high cost areas. Sometimes we spend a lot of time on stuff that's just a few thousand dollars. And I don't know if this is, I don't know where this falls in the range, but certainly we know that what we pay for our nursing facilities is a lot of money. And so I just would, caution that we should probably pay attention to the things that end up costing a lot of dollars. So I hope that we'll have a full opportunity to review this when we do have the fiscal note. Thank you. Representative Liebling, I think that's the paramount importance and I think that we'll take that under consideration. It is being laid over for possible inclusion, but when we mark up the omnibus bill, we'll certainly take a look at that with great scrutiny. Any further questions? Representative Loeffler. Um, well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm wondering if when the, uh, the final fiscal note is received, if the full committee could get it when we get it, rather than just waiting until we see um, the final things. Be and you know, we may potentially want to invite back some, some testimony if there's issues that, get that arise from it. But this is a major part of our budget. So um, having a chance to look at that before markup would be really helpful. I agree. Further questions? Representative Schumacher, you have the last word. I was uh, just inviting Ms. Cook for tea a little bit later. I want to get to know her a little bit better. Um, nothing here, Mr. Chair. I'll renew my motion that uh, House File 500 be laid over for possible inclusion. House File 500 is laid over for possible inclusion in the Health and Human Services Omnibus Bill. Representative Schumacher, you have House File 582. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I will move that House File 582 be laid over for possible inclusion. Representative Schumacher moves House File 582 to be laid over for possible inclusion in the Health and Human Services Omnibus Bill. We have the bill before us. Representative Schumacher, to your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. House File 582 is another clarifying bill. Um, this time clarifying the definition of nurses for uh, the purposes of pool staff. And so the first part of the bill takes care of defining what a nurse is for that. The second part of the bill uh, talks about maximum charges with pool staff ensuring that um, uh, travel cost and lodging for pool staff are included um, in there. And so with that, I will stand for questions. We also have uh, representatives from uh, that can help with uh, any technical questions that may come forward. Any questions or Anyone in the audience that wishes to testify to the bill? Seeing none, we'll go to member questions for the author. Seeing none, any final comments, Representative? <coughs> no, I thank you for your support. 
House file 582 is laid over for possible inclusion in the Health and Human Services Omnibus Bill. Thank you, members. <laughs> members, our next meeting is tomorrow, March 8th at 1 o'clock. We are adjourned.